Hello and a very good afternoon to everyone. Hope you are all doing well. Docplexus has revamped the entire platform for a better look and feel of it and making the user experience one of its kind. So in case you have any feedback for us, do drop us your queries in on the official email address. So for today, I would like to welcome you all to this brand new episode of Wednesday Master Series. Talking about genomics and its integration in the field of psychiatry, I guess it's going to be a very interesting approach to learn from our experts here today. We have two panelists, Dr. Prasad Rao, um, he is the director of the Division of Schizophrenia and uh, uh, Psychopharmacology at Asha Hospital in Hyderabad. He has been involved in training of medical undergraduates and postgraduates in psychiatry and other medical specialties. Uh, Dr. Rao has been doing clinical research and has presented his research works at many national and international conferences. He has won many awards for research and its contribution to psychiatry and services to society. He is currently the Secretary General, Education, Asia Federation of Psychiatric Association, with more than 160 publication articles in the peer reviewed national and international journals of psychiatry and uh, psychiatry. Welcome to the panel, sir. Thank you. Our other panelist is Dr. M. V. Sasidhar, Chief Scientific Officer, Apollo Hospital Education and Research Foundation. Dr. Sasidhar has been actively involved in research, establishing clinical biomarkers using immunological, molecular, in vitro, cell-based and in vivo animal approaches. He also has hands-on experience. He also has hands-on experience in establishment, standardization, and validation of bioassays in areas of oncology, autoimmune diseases, and inflammation. He holds a PhD from Germany in pharmaceutical biotechnology. Dr. Shashidhar has over 15 publications in national and international journals, and we are more than happy to welcome both of you here. Welcome to the panel, sir. Thank uh, you. Thank you, Jessica. Thank, thank you very much. Yes. So without further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Rao for sharing his presentation and talking on biomarkers in psychiatry and its relevance for the future. Yeah, uh, give me a minute. I'm just sharing my slides. Sure, sir. Today, I chose two interesting topics. My friend and a colleague researcher, Dr. Shishidhar, will give you a peep into the second aspect, which is far more far more interesting and important as well. Today, I'm going to present to you the biomarkers in psychiatry and look into the future. In fact, a biomarker in psychiatry is a dream for all psychiatrists and medical specialists. Can we actually identify the disorders, say like cancer? And the way I would like to go is first define the biomarkers today, explain to you the types of biomarkers available, serum, the metabolite, the neuroimaging, cerebrospinal fluid based, and critically check the usefulness of the currently available biomarkers in psychiatry, but more importantly, to look into the future. I, I have a few things to declare. I have no financial conflicts to declare in this, but I do have a bias as both as a clinician and researcher. And I would like, like to say that me and Sheshidhar are looking into Alzheimer's dementias and other dementias, the varieties of biomarkers available today. And we are trying to integrate and look into the new science. And the fundamental question always asked is, can we differentiate our psychiatric disorders from one another biologically? And over the last two, three decades, I would start with the disorder. The most interesting disorder for me is schizophrenia. There are many theories. It was initially like seven blind people looking into the elephant and describing it as a fan, it's a wall, it's a rope, it's a snake, it's a tree, etc., etc. But then over the last four decades, we do have a lot of theories. And as you can see, it was a developmental theory which sustains. It's an autoimmune. Schizophrenia is because of the mother psychologically causing. It is due to dopamine and it is due to the insane world there is an anti-psychiatric people or even a spiritual breakthrough of a nervous breakdown but then the research did taught us that it is no longer a spiritual theory it's definitely not due to the mother albeit in an interesting way it, mother can be a contributor as a genomics and definitely not an anti-psychiatry it is developmental and it is autoimmune and it is due to dopamine 
we do understand much more over the period of time. And schizophrenia, dementia preacoxy, as Kreplin described, today is a polyphenotypic thing. And as you see, a lot of symptomatology differentiate each patient of schizophrenia. But what we understand today is cognitive testing. And the cognitive testing can actually predict the disease. All in all, leads to functional impairment. And these are the features of schizophrenia. Likewise, in a bipolar disorder, which is again a very common psychiatric disorder of a chronic nature. Here, we are based on mood disorders. As the time moved, what we today understand is that most of these two disorders do have a variety of disorders as you treat. A lot of physicians are attending here. Comorbid migraine, comorbid pain disorders, comorbid diabetes, comorbid cardiovascular disorders, comorbid obesity are from the medical side and from the psychiatric side, as you can see, a variety of other disorders coexist with my patients. Today, what we understand in psychiatric illness, and this is something each of your physicians are interested that high blood pressure, obesity, diabetes mellitus, hypercholesteremia are a primary root cause in our disease. And a varieties of psychopathology, as you can see here, oxidative cell damage, insulin resistance, fat cell activity, inflammation, all finally lead to dementia. So in a biomarker research of psychiatry of today, what would happen is we look for a lot of markers. Unlike cancer and biomarkers, which most of you are aware, probably psychiatry is different. To define a biomarker, biomarker is a characteristic which can be evaluated biological process, pathological, and it should be normally present as well. And this is the biomarkers definition working group of psychiatry formed in the world psychiatric association the classification for example i'm going to show you in this cartoon that there are these four markers which we use for dementia the functional connectivity or fmra the csf protein biomarkers the hippocampus volumetry in the mra are all together if you take each one of them contribute to a little but if you take together 90 percent of the diagnosis of dementia is confirmed. And then to add to this, the psychological testing. So one does not simply claim a prediction. As you can see in this next two, three slides, if you keep adding the biomarkers, you might get into a much more simple but clear answer for a disease. And that's what over the last 100 publications of fMRI in psychiatry is able to distinguish between the each disorders in a much better fashion. You might be looking at this graph and say only 40% is now definite. But I think we are still looking for answers in looking for the biomarkers. So contrary to other diseases, the mental illness are classified by diagnostic categories with a broad varieties of lists of symptoms. Consequently, patient diagnosed from the same psychiatric illness present with a great heterogeneity. I'm going to show you another solid evidence if you take a psychiatric diagnosis alzheimer's as you can see in this the reported accuracy increases with the total number of study sample and that's what we are trying to do and biomarkers in psychiatry a critic in one of the most recent publication in annals of neuroscience in 2016 ganesh venkat subramanian and macheri keshwan has commented about the complexity in psychiatric diagnosis so for establishing a coherent and convergent evidence base, a biological abnormality is a specific disorder. One needs to have a stable set of criteria for diagnosis. In psychiatry, sometimes we go into the unenviable catch-22 situation. That is, on one hand, the current classificatory systems are not specifically designed to pave in for identifying valid biological markers. Nevertheless, we are groping in the dark, working with and lack of gold standard diagnostic criteria, the methodological limitations, lack of in vitro models of psychiatric disorders, which have improved over the last two decades, and issues of pathogenic paradigms related to conceptualization of psychiatric disorders. So with this, we'll go to the biomarkers introduction. And as you can see here, 
we are looking for a real ideal biomarkers, like in cancer, like in many other medical diseases. The sensitivity, specificity, cost effective, personalized, managed, quantifiable, and correlation with the clinical outcome. I'm going to show to you that over the last decade, we have changed, we have learned quite a lot. And I'm going to cover a briefly about all these things. The genomics, my colleague, uh, Dr. Sheshizar will talk about this. I don't touch this. The transcriptomics and the proteinomics are the current area of biomarkers research. Metabolomics, using NMR and other tech pass spectrometry. And finally, our own lab, lab on chip technologies, which are developing by the day. And the nanobiotechnology, the most recent biotechnology. And finally, the neuroimaging has been one of those wonderful techniques which we have. The classification of biomarkers, today we talk about type O or the natural history of the disease. I'm going to show you one or two slides about the dementia. Type 1 is essentially useful to test whether the drugs we use for the diagnosis, whether they're helpful. For example, you give insulin and check the blood glucose lowering ability of an antidiabetic, etc. And type 2 is obviously related to surrogate markers. For example, in cardiac diseases, we use LDLC uh, and correlate this with the probably the death rate, death due to heart disease, etc. So we have three types of uh, biomarkers. And biomarkers, as you can see, we are very clear today that it is in process of evolution. Can involve a gene, a set of genes, proteins, or bi biomolecular a lot of things which come from CSF, serum, blood, and even other body fluids. So the application of these biomarkers to the diagnosis and prognosis of psychiatric disorders has been an area of work. And over the period of time, quite a lot we have undermined in Alzheimer's disease because that is one disease which in which we are trying to see how this, and as you can see here, see we have CSF, we have neuroimaging biomarkers, we have plasma biomarkers, and genetic biomarkers. And uh, as you can see, the most important evolution over the time has been the cognitive tests. Now, this cognitive test seems to be picking up the patients. For example, in schizophrenia, you have a pattern of cognitive tests, test results. In dementia, you have another pattern of results. So when compared to normal controls, how do these patients differ? So this is a, entirely a new area of research which is evolving over the last decade. And in the most recent meta-analysis, cognitive profiles of, as you can see in this wonderful graph, the three common disorders in psychiatry, bipolar disorder, major depressive disorder, and schizophrenia disorder, seems to have a different set of cognitive testing. And this probably is the earliest results in which we can say that probably not all patients are same. Then using MRI, I think I'm coming to that in a brief while, in a 20 minute presentation. We know these are the areas which are commonly involved, the medial prefrontal cortex, the anterior cingulate cortex, and basically temporal lobe, amygdala, and hippocampus. Now there seems to be a difference, and today we are marking. Coming to the genomic biomarkers, and this is one area which I would leave it to my friend Sheshizar to talk about. But today, in schizophrenia, we have identified as in this Manhattan curve, we call it 108 gene loci in schizophrenia by almost measuring a few lakh patients of schizophrenia. And the tallest gene, as you can see, is an HLA gene which is, seems to be correlated with schizophrenia. Mind you, ladies and gentlemen, there are 108 gene loci, and this study goes on. This is published in the Nature Journal, and probably this is one point which points out to the developmental and channel genes, and as I showed in the starting, schizophrenia is due to a developmental abnormality, and probably there, is, there will be a time in the near future we can identify these genes. There are varieties of other genes, for example, in this slide, as I'm showing to you, who are different in Alzheimer's dementia. There is a familial pattern of Alzheimer's dementia. 
in which the following genes are seems to be predicting. Likewise, the PSEN gene is found to be most common cause of early onset Alzheimer's disease. In fact, Alas Alzheimer more than 100 years back I diagnosed that it occurs pre-senile. Pre-senile means less than 60 years. And in them, especially the autosomal dominant variety early onset, there seems to be, we identified PSEN as a biomarker. There is another gene which would be predictive of a mood disorder, the serotonin transporter and reuptake gene. And those who have this, we can actually predict pharmacogenomically that they are less likely to benefit from SSRI. So likewise, the dopamine receptor binding variants, there are a few varieties of genes, uh, their association with psychiatric disorders is now well established. And today, for example, combining genotype and the stress, we can actually find a strong correlation with these genes, the 5-HTT LPR genotype. One more important gene, uh, as I said, the uh, genome, APOE, uh, my friend would be talking, but I thought for the completion of biomarkers, I would say this is one great area of research in which we are, both of us are involved right now. The APOE genotype, pre-symptomatic and during the diagnostic aid, we are reaching to a bit of answers, but suffice for me to close the discussion saying a lot of genes are associated with Alzheimer's, but we are still developing better models and thankfully for the machine learning we would probably in the near future can predict the association at a much robust way there are a few inflammatory biomarkers in schizophrenia uh, you, every one of you know about the il1b il6 il8 and ILN 10 and 12 among them the association between these il2 and il1 with the depression seems to be now well established so we also have another biomarker in the shaping of both schizophrenia and mood. Coming to the imaging neuroimaging, the MRI research in Alzheimer's has took leaps and bounds over the time. Today, by using the software, taking a 10 minutes MRI images and using a three Tesla or 1.5 Tesla and above, we can actually arrive at various scores, which is now internationally harmonized, and we can make a clinical diagnosis. And it's this particular dementia protocol can be used also to see the prognosis year by year, the progression. And here I'm showing in these images, the most extreme one here is a normal control. This is a one year picture of the same patient. As you see consistently, the hippocampus is getting slow. The cortical atrophy is well demarcated. And by five years in this patient, of course, it's the same patient's MRI, you find the difference of how a hippocampus got atrophy. So MRI imaging has been uh, one of the cornerstones of dementia research. The second area of imaging is the PET scans. Today we use both MRI imaging and PET imaging, the, especially the PET FDG, to diagnose dementia. And the science as it progressed very well from 2014, right now we have a biomarker of an isotope which can be used in the PET scan, which I'm going to show. Here, as you can see, you can using the PET FDG, this is an Alzheimer's, you have a different pattern. And compared to the frontotemporal, which shows much more significantly in this patient. So you using this, you can differentiate the diagnosis and probably consistently. FTG in Alzheimer's descent, profoundly, this is a new kind of a biomarker which has been US FDA approved, which is now being used. That's called Pittsburgh compound. A Pittsburgh compound actually picks up, as you can see in the next two, three slides, an FDG PET scan is considered reasonable and necessary, but right now we are going even further. We are talking of a recent diagnosis of dementia or cognitive decline, but using a specific Alzheimer's biomarkers and using the criteria for dementia, and this is the Pittsburgh compound, and the other two we can actually clinically diagnose with almost 99% certainty. The newer imaging in the last 
decade is using amyloid imaging. And as you can see very well strongly, this is a new technique. So amyloid deposition is one strong correlates for the Alzheimer's disease. So you, when compared to control, you find here <coughs> that the deposition of amyloid can differentiate the patients. So this is one more area of research which is going on. And as you can see, you can use for prognostication. MCI is an early deficit syndrome, but not really dementia. So how many of MCI people gets converted to Alzheimer's can be a biomarker for testing this. So imaging findings of combining both MRI, FDG PET and amyloid PET together, we can arrive at a more clear diagnosis. Most recent cousin in the imaging is the Tau imaging. In Alzheimer's disease, both amyloid and Tau are, are considered to be patho, pathologically causing the lesions. So this is a new imaging which started over the last decade and a little more than a decade. But now we are getting standardization of this Tau imaging. And now I'm going to show you pictures of the same patient, both MRA, how does it show? And if we add the Tau imaging and right here in the extreme right, my right, of course, is uh, the amyloid. If you combine all the three, the precision in the diagnosis, and as you can see, they are correlate with the MMSC and normal. This is a normal individual, whereas MCI, you find a mild changes and in dementia, you find such a strong. So using the three imaging in a single sitting, because we can combine MRA with Tau imaging or uh, uh, MRA with amyloid imaging, we might get a better answers. So biomarkers have come to stay. In fact, even in other diseases like schizophrenia, the gray matter deficit and differentiation at various places is being used. But this is a stage of development and we need a few more answers. For example, in this, you find the different locations having a clinical finding. There are multiple studies over the last two decades working on the gray matter and white matter lesions in schizophrenia. And this is probably what I'm going to close my presentation. I'm going to suggest, especially in Alzheimer's, we need to use multiple biomarkers to reach out at a clear testing. You have heard about the cognitive testing. You have heard about memory testing. You have heard about genes testing. Now, your last but not the least are the two new inventions. Uh, in this, also, me and Sheshdar are involved in research. We are trying to test the amyloid in retina and to correlate with the other imaging technology. The inflammatory biomarkers is one more area which is being just being studied. Today, we don't really have large answers, but we have the directions which is going to be open. And the hybrid model of neuroimaging and genetic is probably is the one for the future. And that's what we are working in the future. As you can see in this picture, is nothing but prediction due to machine learning. You take hundreds of MRIs nowadays, which are available on the net, and that is being used as to model. And this is the same model. This is one more area which has developed in the recent times. White matter tractography, as you can see, you can actually build up software to identify the white matter tracts, and you can actually identify the lesion. This is called diffuse tensor imaging for the white matter. Here, what we do is, in a live MRI picture, we use a software to find out. We can actually see the white matter integrity, the neuronal networks. You can So we can play with using software and identify the defects. This is called voxel-based diffuse tensor imaging. And this is the newest approach for diagnosing both psychiatric disorders. And the accuracy of the diagnosis, as you can see in this slide, increases if you use all these things. But I think the machine learning will build up this information in a much more. In conclusion, the clinical symptoms, cognitive deficits, psychiatric comorbidities, genetics, all these things are now zeroing on to build up multiple biomarkers and ample evidence that the dichotomy is in fact a continuum. 
So the newer understanding is the newer research will have to lead us to better understanding. And probably our diagnostic system in psychiatry will improve over the time because of the biological basis and the varieties of biomarkers coming. And finally, an emerging genetic environment and environment interaction is better being understood. Like this picture, yes, we can, as Narendra Modi, our prime minister says, we need larger sizes of sample, reduced analytical variability and clean validation. And this can be satisfied by using images. As I said, the functional connectome biomarkers is important. And this is now we are using the software and high-end computerization to reach a diagnosis. It is time to rethink our current symptom-based approach. And then use the genetic information and all the tests to go further. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Remember, social distancing and stay safe is the rule now. Let us say the COVID will go away. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for the patient listening. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, very thorough, very well presented. I would now like to uh, invite uh, Dr. Uh, Sasidhar to share his presentation on genomic integration in the field of psychiatry. So you're sharing your screen. Yeah. Are we good? Yes, sir. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Rao, so for making my life easy. So let me give you the over overview of the outline of the presentation, what we are going through today. So uh, briefly, we are going over genetic testing, have an overview of pharmacogenomics, and then having important consideration about what are the important considerations evaluating a genetic test, and what are the currently available genetic tests in dementia, and what's the clinical relevance of the following uh, genes, FOE, TOM40, PESEN1, PESEN2 in dementia, in specifically Alzheimer's. and. A few slides on the re recent guidelines of uh, genetic testing and also on the ethical and the legal and the social challenges that are involved uh, during genetic testing. So before going into these things, let's just let us uh, spend some few minutes understanding how a drug uh, is, uh, is have a proper action in our body. Like when we take a drug, what generally happens, it's generally the absorption, the distribution, the target interaction and the metabolism. And there are many factors such as the gender, the body mass, the age, the disease and the genetic factors which influence the action of these drugs. So, and once we take the drug, there is, uh, we very well knew that all the drugs do not function the same in every individual. And there is a reason why uh, every individual is different in terms of the action of the drug. So there are two different fields of sciences, as you know, one is the pharmacogenetics, where pharmacogenetics is the study of the genetic cause of the individual variation in a drug response. And in pharmacogenomics, where there's a, uh, this is a study where there is a genome wide analysis we do in, in terms of estimating the drug efficacy and the toxicity. And at the same time, let us also consider two different aspects of the drug, like when we take a drug, there are two different things that is happening, like how the drug is handled in the body and how the drug affects the body. So the, so these are the two things that happen in the body. So here we are looking at ABCB1 gene, where which causes multi-drug resistance uh, in epilepsy. So the MDR, M, through the MDR1 gene. And the second thing is the, in the pharmacodynamics example, we can consider the C2C19 gene which have a response in the HLA and also on the GPCRs. So having a background now on pharmacokinetics, what is pharmacokinetics, what is pharmacodynamics, let us understand what briefly pharmacogenomics is. So as we said before that all the drugs do not have a same effect on the, all the patients at the same time and their degree of efficacy is different. In some of the patients, you have a full response and some other patients, you have a partial response and some you have an adverse reaction. 
and some there is no response at all so this results in uh, different conditions wherein for each drug you can uh, have a ultra metabolizer where there is a he responds to the increased dosage of the drugs and also it's the second more category is an extensive metabolizer which responds to a normal dosage of the drug the third category is a poor metabolizer which responds to a reduced dosage of the drug the fourth category is the poor metabolizer the ultra rapid metabolizer where we have to look for a alternative medication so having an overview of the different aspects of the pharmacogenomic uh, test the different concepts of pharmacogenomics let us see briefly uh, what happens in typical pharmacogenomic cycle and what is the need of a pharmacogenomic uh, test that is in the psychiatric field so briefly when a physician orders the pharmacogenomic test you do a sampling of the biomaterial which can be saliva serum or uh, blood uh, which is sent to the laboratory and is analyzed through different uh, PCR techniques or RFLP. So, which results in uh, uh, getting a allele or a genotype. And this helps in development of a personal treatment and strategy basing on the genotype of the patient. So, now why should health professionals know about genetic testing for uh, genetic testing? Because these are very common diseases that are now coming up. There is a lot of public interest on genetic testing. There is a wide coverage of due to genetic testing. And also the direct DTC, direct to market genetic testing is now available. The patients will turn to the health care providers for more information and more advice. So, okay, now we have an overview of uh, genetic testing. And what are the considerations for adopting of the genetic testing to the clinic? So. The first consideration is can the marker be reliably genotyped uh, can it be reliably tested there the series of uh, details that needs to be incorporated is the analytical validity whether it's a single marker test or whether it's an ngs based assays the second thing is how valid is the association of the disease is the sample size is sufficient is the repli uh, uh, whether the replication has been done properly whether the functional association has been established whether the meta-analysis has been done properly so the third uh, aspect is the clinical utility of the test. Uh, for that, we need the effect size, the unique information, and also the treatment triaging, which leads to the benefits and the diagnosis. So I just spend a few minutes on the uh, uh, disease area where I'm spending, um, uh, talking on. One is the dementia. So dementia, as you know, is basically a progressive cognitive impairment uh, that interferes with activities of daily living at home, at work, or as in social activities. So there is an impairment when there should be an impairment in at least two uh, cognitive domains. Either it could be the memory function, the executive function, the visual spatial ability, the language, or the personal uh, barrier. So this slide gives you a glimpse of what actually happened, how the field is progressing. So up till 2011, you need uh, an, both the clinical criteria and the neuropathological criteria in order to ascertain the AD diagnosis. From the 2011 things changed and finally at this time we have the neuropathological uh, uh, parameters into consideration where importance is more being given to the biomarkers which I will not dwell more in as uh, Dr. Rao had rightly mentioned in. So Alzheimer disease is a major component of the dementias. Uh, it's almost 60 to 80 percent of the dementias or Alzheimer disease. And here you can see there's some, uh, it's a collection of symptoms related to cognitive decline and also some causes of cognitive decline are reversible and not truly uh, dementias. So I'll not dwell into the, the how dementias diagnose, you are the experts, but basically you, you, have, you do, do the symptom history, then you do the family history, followed by a neurological examination and neuropsychological testing and neuroimaging. Um, now, as you can see, in order to make life easy and in order to make better prognosis, better diagnosis of the things, many new techniques are being brought into the system. One is the brain imaging. Second thing is the biofluid analysis. Uh, here I will dwell in a few uh, minutes, basically in, to explain what biofluid analysis is. Uh, so there are new techniques that are coming up, the circulatory markers that are coming up, which is basically exosomes. Uh, which actually carry these biomarkers and can be quantified from the 
uh, basic blend itself. Therefore, there is you can bypass the need of a CSF in order to get uh, a proper diagnosis. The third category is the genetic and emerging biomarkers, what we are right now uh, discussing in. Uh, just to spend a few time on the impact of the dementia, as you can see, there's almost one case in every three seconds. And there are globally, there are almost 46.8 million people worldwide. And this number will almost double in every 20 years. And in India, we have almost 4.5 million people. And conservative estimate says that it's only 10% that, that is being diagnosed. And further, and much of the increase of these dementias is believed to take, in, take place in the low and middle income countries. Um, and if dementia has to be considered as an economy, it would dementia treatment and would cost almost the, and it can be considered as the 18th largest economy. So, and further, this map shows the estimated number of people living with dementias all over the world. So this gives them a glimpse like how, why dementia is very important to be treated. And another very important aspect about the dementias is dementia has a typical window phase that's almost 10 to 15 years before its actual clinical expression, where there's a symptomatic treatment. It has a pre-MCI and MCI stage where it can be actually diagnosed. So uh, although there are no curative aspects for the uh, curative aspects for Alzheimer's, uh, they can they can be uh, you, uh, you can have uh, oxidative therapies, you can have control over the comorbid conditions, you can have control over the risk factors, thereby you can push the clinical expression of the disease that is where what the most of the scientists believe in. That's you can alter the course of Alzheimer's di uh, disease trajectory by a, a five to 10 years. Uh, so com coming to the risk factors of the Alzheimer's, you can see that uh, comorbid factors and the risk factors like the, the diet, the smoking, the alcohol, the diabetes, hypertension, and the genes. Uh, one, one is the susceptibility genes such as FOE and TOM40 and the uh, first degree family history genes that is the PESN1 and the PESN2. They make a com uh, impact on, they make a considerable impact on expression of Alzheimer's. And slowly the, pro, the diagnosis, the mode of the diagnosis of Alzheimer's is slowly being changed where now people now recognize that there is initial prodromal stage followed by the mild cognitive stage followed by the mild moderate and the severe dementia. And there is an opportunity to diagnose this disease further, uh, much earlier and much better. So there are three, three important categories of biomarkers. One is the amyloid pathology, the tau pathology, and the neurodegeneration pathology, which collectively uh, may lead to the cognitive impairment. And the NIA, the recent NIA AA guidelines, uh, which which gives importance to the ATN guidelines, which is the uh, amyloid pathway, the tau pathway, and the neurodegeneration, we, uh, which can be made to the FTG PET. This can be hel uh, helpful in order to get a cumulative diagnosis of the disease. So now come now having a fair idea of what dementia is, now fair idea of how the other different biomarkers, let us go into the different aspects of the pharmacogenomics of the dementia. So we know that only 20 to 30 percent of the patients with dementia respond positively to the conventional drugs like donepezal galantamine and everything so now the blame or the aspect can be through can be considered or be attributed to the pharmacogenomics where approximately 60 to 70 percent of the therapeutic outcome depend upon the pharma's genomic criteria so the various genes that are associated with the ad pathogenesis are the person one the person two the prnp and the poe so and the genes associated with the mechanism of the action of the genes are with the various enzymes in the uh, receptors so here, uh, these are the, the genetic testing has already been in the psychiatry. And here in this slide, you can see the rare alleles that is the APP, PESN1 and the PESN2 where the effect size is almost very high. And you also can see the common uh, thing that's the APOE4 and the uh, where it's a common variant including the susceptibility of the Alzheimer's. A very important aspect here is the genetic testing. So genetic testing here, you have to consider that um, everybody comes with a degree of with a, when we consider this empty basket here, everybody has few genetic factors, genetic risk factors. Uh, some have less, some have more, and the blue one here represents the uh, other factors here. 
and over the course of the life people are exposed to different factors and they accumulate the various comorbid factors and that is factors here so some have less number of genes and they need more risk factors in order to manifest a disease and some have more number of bad genes and they require only the less number of uh, uh, comorbid factors or the risk factor factors to think so having a gene susceptibility gene alone is not sufficient it is also the environment which actually impacts the expression of the disease that's a very important consideration to uh, take care of so let us also have a very brief pass through of the eoad what is the early onset uh, desire of the presenile uh, alzheimer's where we generally look into the major genes that's the person one the person two and the app which is generally five five percent of the total alzheimer thing and in the symptomatic testing which is generally considered as the load that is the the late onset uh, ad here uh, apoe is one of the important uh, as uh, gene factor that is generally considered so age is one of the major contributor of the alzheimer's and risk increases uh, drastically after uh, 60 years and also having a first degree with ad also increases the lifetime risk of uh, alzheimer's further uh, Alzheimer's uh, basically have considered as two things. One is the EOAD, as I said before, where APP, person 1 and person 2 are the important thing. And the late onset where susceptibility genes such as APOE4 and the TOM40 is general uh, few uh, genes. So let us uh, spend a few uh, uh, minutes over APOE. So APOE is a gene encoding for the apolipoprotein A, uh, E and so in, uh, involved with APO Alzheimer's disease and also with cardiovascular complications. It has two, two, three major alleles, that is the two, three and four. Two is considered as protective and three is considered as neutral and four is considered as the pathogenic uh, thing. And as said before, uh, having a and it occurs in two different uh, states uh, like uh, homozygous and heterozygous conditions. So pre-symptomatic for E4 is recommended with care and, and for proper planning. And, uh, and it's also its role as a diagnostic aid, aid is also evolving and maturing. And as all the complications of the Alzheimer cannot be explained with AD, uh, a new gene TOM40 could also explain the complications in AD uh, in case of the uh, uh, APOE 3 by 3. So APOE e is a major susceptibility gene for AD. The risk increases ninefold, and if APOE 4 alone dose is there, the risk is further doubled. And APOE is the principal cholesterol carrier here, and APOE doubles the risk, but high cholesterol also triples the AD risk. So this slide actually gives you a distribution and the frequency of the APOE genotypes in the CNS disorders. And here you can see the uh, APOE4 in case of Alzheimer's, where it's almost six, uh, the odds ratio is. And here in this slide, you can see uh, how APOE actually contributes towards the uh, progression of the AD, the setting of the AD, uh, decreasing the onset of the onset time of the AD in terms of the a beta burden the insulin signaling the glucose metabolism the synaptic function so uh, this apoe4 plays a very important role and this uh, ratio uh, this uh, order of the thing gives you a glimpse how apoe4 can dominate the uh, ad expression so this slide actually gives you an apoe e genotype in terms of the amyloid beta deposition, uh, where the odds ratio for the AD development is 14.49, and whereas in the healthy individual it is 1.9. So, um, as you can see, uh, even the, there are uh, the 3 by 3 and the 2 by 3 also, uh, there are many, uh, uh, they are also positive factors of the AD. But in order to explain the risk factor, uh, another molecule that is no TOM40 has come into picture and people have researched it and this genotyping test is also commercially uh, available and TOM40 exists in three different genotypes and here I'm giving you a PC RFLP based thing so where it can be divided into the L, the long form, the short form and the long and the short form. Um, so the long form is the disease pro promoting, the short form is the neutral and the LS is the medium. 
so a person having the ll uh, is, is the more disease promoting so this is the algorithm which actually explains uh, how epoe genotype along with the tom40 can help you to diagnose much better um, uh, thing uh, so epoe 3 by 3 when uh, ca that is can be further explained with the tom40 genotype along with the age so this picture gives you a combined Im impact of tom40 and the epoe prognosis where you can see that having uh, tom for uh, epoe4 and an l by l further increases the risk and the onset thing so another important aspect is that both these genes uh, epoe the present one and everything also have an pharmacogenetic effects on the different ad drugs that the donabizil the memantine and the tacrine and then the rivastamine so epoe4 are the worst responders to these drugs and epoe3 carriers are the best responders to the conventional treatment and SPS carries are the best responders and L by L are the worst responders. So having a fair idea, uh, having an idea of about these genotypes makes life easy for the doctors in order to give the correct dose, the correct prescription, correct medication without a trial and error to their patients, uh, which gives quality uh, life to the people. Uh, this slide actually gives an overview of the lifetime risk of ApoE4 and the TOMS40 here. So you can see here, uh, having a homozygous 4x4 increases the onset time and also uh, and, and, and the picture to the uh, right of me actually gives you an overview of what's happening with the genotype combined with the TOM40 genotype, uh, how you can pre predict the age of the onset. So now we have a fairly better idea of what genotyping is, what gen uh, pharmacogenetic testing in terms of APOE is and TOM40 is. L let us dwell a few minutes upon the, eth the ethical, the legal and the uh, issues of the genetic testing. So informed consent is one of the primary area uh, that is needs to be uh, taken care of. The disclosure of the results, care should be taken for disclosure of the uh, results and efforts have to be spent in order to understand about the privacy and the confidentiality of keeping the uh, results pro, uh, thing in consideration. And there should be a proper genetic counseling in order to uh, go before giving the test. Um, so now, uh, so let us uh, go through the genetic testing considerations. So Alzheimer, as you now know now that Alzheimer develops due to a complex interaction between the genetics and the environment and having a first degree relative increases the risk and the genetic testing can be considered for patients with AD with onset of 60 to 65 or those who have uh, close relatives, uh, the two types and a member of the family in which there is an identified ABP and a patient one and a patient two. So why genetic testing is advisable in dementia is yes, it makes life easy. Uh, you can think about the safety of the individual, having less stress, uh, early education of the caregivers uh, knows how to handle the patients. So advanced planning can be given, the specific tra treatments are now being available for, available for the AD patients. So this gives an opportunity to participate in the clinical testing. And these are the some, uh, some of the different slides where you can um, get more information uh, regarding the genetic testing of uh, Alzheimer's. Thank you so much, sir. Very uh, well presented and thorough presentation, both of you. Um, I would like to now move on to the questions. Uh, so I will ask questions and it could be uh, both of you could maybe uh, contribute to the questions. If that's okay. Yeah. Sure. So uh, the first question is what are the measures to improve genomic literacy in India? So Dr. Sashidhar, maybe you could start. Uh, I can, I can take this. Sure. So basically uh, it's, uh, uh, you are borrowing this concept from the health literacy. So genomic health literacy is the capacity to obtain, process, and understand the use of the genetic information. Um, so the how can we improve genetic literacy is 
basically you know uh, revision of the medical curriculum in order to inculcate the gen- literature uh, introduction as a new graduate programs in genomics and bioinformatics uh, genomic workshops could be some of the things fellowships for genomic understanding the various online courses currently that course era and better thing will make the future learn and maybe your own thing that little doc less uh the community outreach strategies uh genomic counseling services so i think this is some of the things i could uh mention dr rao if you would want to like to add something to this so you uh, could you please unmute unmute uh yes. i would agree with sheshi uh, on one issue the science is as much as the genomics progressed so public med- education on the genomics is definitely on the priority and i would request doc plus to take a leadership in promoting this the second important change which is going to happen is the pharmacogenomics which is going to come in the near future so apart from that what uh, he said the science as in cancer biomarkers and genomics is an important area because people look for it so that's how a science progresses sure sir uh, also sir we do see that genomics in general is now a uh, sort of but a budding field in india so could you talk about how it interacts with other specialties so like like today for example we are talking about psychiatry how does it interact and what is the importance there for that dr rao if you could answer that yeah i think uh, that's a very important question genomics is interactive in a multiple ways and in one of my slide i have shown hypertension diabetes hypercholesteremia and a variety of things leading to uh, medical disorders and uh, psychiatric disorders so this goes without saying that all our medical colleagues are involved in diagnosing in a both two ways strain see psychiatric disorders can cause medical disorders medical disorders in turn can lead to psychiatric disorders so knowledge sharing and knowledge interaction like doc press is doing today we are sharing a totally new area of research uh, into the others and of course uh, interacting much more at multiple conferences their conferences we attend our conferences they attend we reach it out sure dr hashida you want to add something to that uh, like has he rightly pointed out like uh, things don't happen in isolation diseases uh, having uh, having diabetes leads to alzheimers having hypertension leads to hy- alzheimers so uh, and there are pharmacogenetic tests available in uh, in order to make uh, life easy for diabetes hypertension and uh, other drugs that are available for platelets uh, monitoring and everything so it's everything is interlinked uh, so overall health actually leads to uh, proper control of uh, alzheimers and uh, having control over the comorbid conditions and keeping solid uh, neurological health and uh, antioxidant therapy would make uh, would lead to proper uh, integration of genetic testing into the mainstream the clinical practice i guess sure uh, so the second question now coming to the ethical and legal measures what should be considered while community uh, communicating test results to the patients what ethical and legal measures so that's so a more yeah with? that's a very uh, very complex question but it can be answered simply like that in uh, ethical consideration in uh, is governed by indian rules and laws for example in america the data above 18 years should be communicated only to that individual not even to the parents in india the law is little more flexible that legally accepted relative can be communicated see for just like communicating the the test results of aids or something the confidentiality the precision and to the knowledge what it leads has to be communicated only to the person who got tested and that usually covers in the con- in the consent we take in the consent also it's mentioned whom should be communicating so these are the few things which is hap- applicable in the indian law so keep that in mind when we communicate they should not be loose talks they should not be telling to other relatives especially when the marriages happens very recently 
you communicate to the husband also sometimes it is a legal issue for the doctor so be careful in what you talk with the relatives see the relationship but legally accepted relative can be communicated dr ashugar anything to add on to that uh yeah i totally agree with uh, with dr rao and uh, i think the patient or the surrogate um, in case in term, as we are in india so they are uh, instructed about this they would consent uh, consent and uh, and proper explanation of the test and um, patient confidentiality and the ordering physician will be notified about the disclosure so maybe the results should be uh, disclosed uh, better to the doctor and the doctor can communicate uh, to the patient for proper uh, explanation of the result uh, of the outcome of the thing which can be better explained sure uh, sir our next question is uh, around genetic discrimination so do you, do you think this is this is still prevalent and if so what measures should be adopted to prevent discrimination based on genetic information so dr shashidhar if you want to start this one so genetic discrimination in um, uh there are certain guidelines that are uh, uh, genetic discrimination is basically discriminating an individual basing on the uh, genetic know, knowing the genetic uh, risk of the individual um, there are two major areas as you can understand one is the employment and the second thing is the insurance these are two general areas where genetic discrimination generally uh, is considered um so in order to there are different uh, guidelines that are uh, available one is the gina that is the genetic discrimination uh, act and the second thing is the hipaa that is the privacy act which generally uh, prevents others uh, to access the patient records uh, so they are guidelines that are available which actually protects the thing uh, ensuring implementation of the guidelines would actually help in uh, the genetic discrimination and that i would uh, say dr rao i think we have come a long way and what shishdar said is that in our government country as it is progressing we have to stick to the rules of the law much more precisely uh, in 1960s and 50s uh, remember the second world war when uh, there used to be kind quite a lot misuse in research today we are forming uh, international following the international uh, harmonizations of clinical act both for good clinical practice and good clinical research i think we should stick to the rule be very careful no discrimination based on genetic is the is the message which we can give through doc bless uh also what steps can be undertaken to prevent a legal liability here uh i think that's again a loaded question if you may we can talk for one hour about the legal implication but most important legal implication is uh for us see divulging what the patient has the test should be correct and the answer should be interpretable properly for example interpretation of genetic uh, information is a uh art done only by clinical geneticists and some clinicians so we should not jump our line the second thing is for example you give a message that it's going to be like this for your life when we you should know the science properly before giving a communication that's why today's world in our both our presentation we talked about probability and how much we can diagnose but i think science will progress i mean the liability for a wrong information you are liable but if you are giving the information as it is and probably record it properly and consent taken at the time is sufficient to cover you you are not being punished for a wrong uh, right thing you will be punished only for a wrong thing you communicate wrongly which is not there dr shashidhar you want to add something to that um so liability basically uh the transition that's now happening from genetics to genomics uh is giving this issue of the liability and as he brightly pointed out uh the failure to communicate results the failure to warn family members uh incorrect variant calls they can be uh like science progresses science is progressing and the information that is correct at this moment of the time is being upgraded slowly 
uh, and uh, one has to keep a brief with the technology both majorly the genetic companies who are uh, conducting the tests and uh, proper dissemination of the knowledge that is right at that moment may may change or may evolve down the lane so keeping uh, to the point and to the science i think it makes life easy for everybody sure one last question mm -hmm. for the panel so could you talk about the importance of accreditation and certification of genetic testing laboratories I think uh, Shesher is the best person to answer. There are standards being coming and Shesher would be answering that. So basically, uh, uh, you have to understand that accreditation and certification is something uh, important for, uh, for having a final control over the uh, final control over the test. So uh, what basically accreditation is, it's a procedure by which uh, authoritative body gives formal recognition that a body or a person is competent to do a specific task. Uh, there are many accreditation bodies that the UCAS, the CIA, the COFRAG, and following different guidelines like the ISO 17025. And when certification is basically a procedure by which a third party gives uh, assurance that a product, a process, or a service conforms to a specific requirement. So. Uh, uh, having both accreditations and uh, uh, these things gives belief, confidence in the results. And uh, uh, physicians and uh, doctors should thrive for organizations who have these accreditations and certifications because they ensure quality. Correct, correct. I think uh, that were all the questions we had. Um, so I would like to again thank you so much to Dr. Rao and Dr. Shashidhar for being such great speakers for us today. Beautifully summarized the integration here. Um, I would also like to thank both of you on behalf of DocPlexus for your valuable time and insights. Um, sir, any uh, closing yeah. remarks for the day? Yeah, I think uh, we are very happy with the way DocPlex uh, is conducting the uh, imparting of education. And uh, we are there, me and Shashi. Who are, our primary area of research has been dementia. Uh, you can ask any questions. You can uh, forward to us. We'll answer to our best ability. Definitely. Definitely. Sure. Thanks. Sir, any closing remarks for you? Okay, thank you so much, sir. Uh, I would also like to thank all the viewers for joining us today. We would be back with such interesting webinars. Until then, please take care and keep supporting Dog Plexus. Thank you so much to both of you. Thank you.